Our last video for this section is on error. So if we're trying to do some sort of statistical study, we're asking a group of people because we want to get an accurate result that's true for the entire population, okay? And so there are mistakes that we can make um, and unavoidable error that we get uh, just from doing the study in this way. And so we're gonna talk about the different kinds of error um, and then the ways that error can be introduced so that we can avoid doing that uh, when we're designing statistical studies. So uh, first I want to talk about the difference between sampling and non-sampling error. Okay? So as I was saying, if you're asking a group of people to try and find out what the entire population of people thinks about something, you're never going to get it quite right. So say that exactly 50% of Americans uh, prefer chocolate ice cream over vanilla ice cream and 50% prefer vanilla over chocolate, right? If you asked 100 people, would you get exactly 50 that say they prefer chocolate and 50 that say they prefer vanilla? Vanilla? It's very unlikely, right? You're not probably going to get exactly what you would expect um, no matter what, okay? This is called sampling error. So sampling error... is unavoidable and it comes from asking a sample instead of the whole group. So if you wanted to know something about what Stevenson students thought, you would have to ask every single Stevenson student if you wanted to find out the exact percentage of students who, for example, wanted pastel grading, right? But instead, since we take a sample, we might get something close. And if we ask enough people, we'll get something that's close to what we expect, um, close to the right answer, but we're not necessarily gonna get exactly the right answer, okay? And so even if we do everything right, we're always going to have some error. That's called sampling error, okay? Non-sampling error is the error that we get from doing things wrong, okay? So if we make mistakes in how we ask people the question, uh, for example, like doing a convenience sample where we just be like, oh, I'm just going to put a post up on my Instagram feed, that is called non-sampling error, okay? So non-sampling error comes from our mistakes. So if we ask the question wrong, or if we ask the wrong people, or don't get a representative sample, all of these introduce non-sampling error. Okay? So these terms can be a little confusing. So remember, sampling error just comes from the fact that we're sampling that we're taking a sample rather than asking everyone. Non-sampling error is any kind of error about mistakes that we make, okay? So I wanna talk a little bit about the different kinds of things that we can mess up um, that cause non-sampling error and give you a list of kind of some things to avoid or to watch out for when you're looking at statistical studies. So non-sampling error. Okay, and this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some things to watch out for. So one is biased sampling, okay? So for example, like I said, if you just do ask a question through an Insta post, um, you are gonna get a biased sample because you're just gonna get your friends. And unless you're trying to find out what your friends think about something, that's gonna be a biased sample. It's not gonna be a sample of all students on Stevenson, okay? So for example, if you asked all, say you wanted to know something about what all Stevenson students thought and you only asked seniors, right? If that's a question like, do you think that everybody on campus should pay for graduation robes um, so that seniors don't have to pay for it? A lot of seniors might like that, but not everybody else would necessarily, okay? So that's an example of bias sampling. If you ask the wrong people, 
or your selection of people is biased in some way, then you're not going to get a good answer. Okay? The next one um, is what are called self-selected samples. So if you let people decide whether they want to answer your poll or not, that's going to bias it inherently uh, because people who feel very strongly are more likely to choose. So this would be, for example, a voluntary poll online. Um, like I said in the last video about, you know, like if people on Greenpeace's website are asking questions about fracking, they may be, feel very strongly about it. And so they self-select and decide to answer this poll. Um, that's usually a problem because it's going to get you biased results. Okay? Next one is small sample sizes. Um, so what this means, a small sample size, the smaller your sample size is, the worse your results are going to be, the less accurate your rules are, rule, your results are going to be. And that's because if you think about it, if you ask 30 people, is that going to likely get you a good agreement with everybody on campus? Probably not. If you just ask five people, it's going to be even worse, right? Because those five people might feel one way and everybody else feels differently. Okay, so we'll talk more about kind of what makes the sample size big enough. Um, in general, uh, more than 50 to 100 is usually enough. Um, but the more people you ask, the better your results get. And we'll talk about that all later in the semester. Um, smaller than 50, um, you start to have really kind of big errors um, in your results. Okay, um, next, what are called leading or influencing questions? So a leading question is one where you're trying to get somebody to answer in a particular way. So for example, if I said, um, you know, uh, Dogs are well known to be um, involved in more violent incidents than other pets. Uh, dog bites send so many children to the hospital every year. Do you think that a dog is a good pet for a child? Right? If I ask the question in that way, and I, I'm a dog person, so I, I love dogs, um, and I don't think, agree with any of that. Um, if I ask the question in that way, I'm leading you to answer and say, oh no, obviously, obviously not a dog isn't a good pet for a child, right? Like something like that. So leading or influencing questions, the way that you write the question can influence the way that people answer. And so that's something you have to watch out for if you're uh, designing a survey, okay? Um, next one, confusing correlation and causation. Okay, so um, this is an old kind of saw. You may have heard this before. Don't confuse cause it, correlation and causation. Um, so what correlation is, is it's when two things happen at the same time. Causation is the idea that one thing is actually causing another. So let me give you an example of a correlation that isn't the same thing as causation. So um, something that you can see, if you look at data um, and go back and look at kind of the data from years and years, when the price of cars goes down, the divorce rate goes up, okay? So if the price of an automobile, like if you look at the general average price of a car in America, if that goes down, the divorce rate rises, okay? And so these two things are correlated. They're, what we say is negatively correlated. One goes down, the other one goes up. But that's not important, they, they're correlated. There's a relationship between them. When one changes, the other one changes. Now, does this mean that the price of cars dropping is causing the divorce rate to increase? No, absolutely not. There's no causal relationship there. One is not causing the other, uh, neither direction, okay? What's happening, and this is generally um, something that can happen whenever you've got something like this, 
what causes the price of cars to go down? Well, an economic downturn will cause the price of cars to go down because people are less likely to spend money, so they reduce prices to try and sell them. Okay? What else does an economic downturn cause? An increase in the divorce rate. When people, when the economy gets worse, people argue more with their spouses about money, which is a common cause for divorce. Okay, that last video locked up on my computer. So starting with the next one um, and moving right along. So don't confuse correlation and causation. Just because two things happen at the same time doesn't mean one causes the other. Okay, a few more things. Um, conflict of interest. Look at who's asking you the question. Um, so a famous example of this, a study that was done, um, showed that um, this was done in the 70s or 80s, showed that fat, is, consuming a high fat diet is very harmful and it's one of the leading causes of death in America. Okay. So this study, there is definitely some truth to it. I'm not saying that it's completely wrong, but this study was funded by the sugar industry. Um, and so the sugar industry put all of this money into convincing people that fat was bad for you because they wanted people to eat higher sugar foods rather than higher fat foods. Um, so always watch out for conflict of interest. Think about who's asking you the question and what's in it for them. Okay. The last thing, and this is related to the confusing correlation and causation is what's called confounding. Okay. So in the example I talked about with confusing correlation and causation, where the cost of cars was going down, the divorce rate was going up, there was what we call a confounding factor, which is the economic um, downturn, right? The economic status. And so confounding is when there's something else you're not thinking about that's causing a change in your data, okay? So you have to think about kind of what else could be causing me to get these results other than what I'm trying to study, okay? So the relationship between what you find and what you were studying isn't always the only relationship there, okay? There might be some other confounding factor um, like the economic status that's causing both of the things to change, okay? So those are different non-sampling errors. You should always try and avoid these. If you find a study that does one of these, so for example, if there's a conflict of interest, don't necessarily trust the data that they're getting. Um, maybe it's good, maybe it's not, but all of these kinds of things, if you see these in a study, it should make you wonder, is this a good study? Are these results true?